Вітаю всіх учасників, хто приєднався до нашого вебінару, також тих, хто продовжує. I would like to welcome all the participants who have already joined our webinar and those who are continuing to join us. We would like to welcome everyone and we can see that the number of participants is increasing when for people joining us. We are happy to welcome you to the webinar on behalf of the British Council. We call it EdTech in Higher Education Practical Advice. I'm Julia Sobel and I am the manager for educational projects in the British Council and this webinar is the third one and in the series of the modern approaches to education. During these webinars, uh, the uh, professors, teachers, uh, faculty from Ukraine share their experience, their practical advice, approaches to teaching and I'd like to remind you that we carry out these webinars within the framework of the project of improvement on the teaching excellency in higher educational education. The British Council is carrying out with the uh, HE uh, education and the uh, Quality Assurance Agency of Ukraine. And among of these speakers of this program, we have the participants of this program. We have carried out two webinars about the proactiveness and assessment of the students. You can watch uh, the uh, recordings of these webinars on the website or YouTube of the channel of the British Council. Our webinar is in Zoom at present, but we have online broadcasting to Facebook. So we are happy to welcome the educational community who are watching us both in Facebook and in Zoom. I'd like to underscore that the participants of webinar who are joining us in Zoom and are going to get a certificate about the participation in this webinar. We know your contacts, so we know your email addresses. We are going to send these certificates next Monday. So please, after the webinar, uh, don't write to us and uh, remind us of sending the certificate, the certificates. We are going to send them at the beginning of the next week. For those who are watching us in Facebook, uh, you will be able to watch the whole of the webinar that you would like to get a certificate. Please write us to the email address, which is going to be provided uh, during the broadcasting and the, please write your email address to our to us and we will be able to send a certificate for you but only for those who are going to send a request today and who is going to do it uh, during the broadcasting so let's go over to today's topic today's topic is a tech in higher education practical advice it's not by chance that we have used the EdTech acronym, because since lately, a lot of people have heard this word. It becomes more and more popular, and the majority of you know what does it mean. EdTech, uh, these are digital tools which are used for education and learning purposes. They don't include only the online education, but various platforms and apps for self-development. The sector of tech was developing quite dynamically prior to the pandemic of COVID-19, but the pandemic has accelerated this process. And within the last two years, each professor, each teacher faced a necessity to use the educational technologies. And we are going to discuss it and not only discuss it, but demonstrate some of the platforms, some of the tools which could be useful for your work. And apart from that, this webinar is going to be useful not only to the uh, professors of the humanitarian sciences, but also the technical sciences, uh, because uh, we are uh, going uh, to use various platforms and various tools which are accessible to the teachers, professors and lecturers. During the webinar, you will be able to put the questions to the speakers at the end of each presentation. And we have a speaker from Great Britain. And that's why for those uh, who need the translation services, you will be able to use those translation services and listen to the presentation in English. And you can push the translation button or interpretation and 
please use the Ukrainian channel. And this is where you will be able to listen to the translation. And we have two interpreters who are going to help you. So let us go over to giving the floor to our speakers. I'm happy to introduce our first guest to us. He is Joan Pollock, and he is the Doctor of Sciences, the head of the strategic planning in the area of education of the company's Promixin. And this company is developing the interactive solutions for education. I'd like to remind you that you have an opportunity to listen his presentation in Ukrainian translation, if you need that. And you will be able also to ask the questions. I'm happy to give the floor to John Colic, please. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, let me just share my screen. Share my screen. Okay. And let me turn to presentation mode. So first of all, can you can everybody see the screen uh, in presentation mode? Yes, we can. We are? Good, excellent. Okay. Um, hello, my name's John Colic. I'm head of international education strategy at Promethean. Um, we are a global education technology company. We work closely with local partners all around the world. Our partner in Ukraine, uh, we're delighted to be cooperating with the company B2B Solutions. My personal background is in uh, higher education. For 15 years, a long time ago, I taught English literature and philosophy at university. So I'm, I'm familiar with the challenges that, that um, lecturers like myself face on a day-to-day -day basis. What I want to do today is talk about future students and future teachers. I'm going to have a look at how the events of the last two years have impacted on the development of ed tech. And also think about some of the important trends that were already emerging, um, which will impact on what we do as students or as teachers or as lecturers. And I hope that out of this, I can give you some useful tips uh, to help you both teach and learn. So the current crisis uh, has made us think, has made us radically rethink some of our teaching and learning priorities, certainly at a global level. Um, I think there will be a strong influence on the development, particularly of pedagogy, and it's also going to increase the need for innovation and adaptation. Um, we need to think carefully about the skills and the support that students and lecturers and teachers will need to move forward. Um, and what has happened is that the situation has already challenged a lot of our assumptions about how technology works in education. Uh, in general, um, we've seen that there's going to be permanent changes in our approach to access to technology, to teaching, how we teach, um, particularly around well-being and mental health. Um, assessment and also monitoring and governance. But the news isn't all bad, and a lot of these changes will offer us real opportunities. Now, when, um, as far as online education is concerned, uh, before we, we were faced with the global COVID crisis, um, the idea was the latest technology would provide us online with rich learning content and resources and lessons for students at home, we would have virtual reality, we'd have the metaverse, all these fantastic methods of education that would give us a fantastic experiential and connected approaches to learning. It's a, fun, it's a very powerful dream, um, but as we've seen over the last couple of years, the reality is actually quite different. Um, some of you may already have seen this photograph. It's taken from security camera footage on a building site in Peru. And the guards, the security guards noticed that night after night, a student was coming um, to the middle of the building site and sitting underneath the lamps. And when they asked what he was doing, he basically was saying he was doing his homework because at home there was no electricity. And as soon as the sun went down, he couldn't do any more studying. So he had to come to the building site where there was still light. And this, this is a very good example of how a lot of our assumptions based around technology and education and online education aren't really valid anymore. Um, connectivity is, is perhaps the most important um, point uh, to think about when we are thinking about remote learning in the future. Globally, only 
14% of the world's population have access to broadband. And only 44% have access to any kind of fixed line internet. And obviously, uh, if, you're, if you're rich, if you live in a city, then you're, you stand a better chance of being able to access than if you're living in a remote or rural community. Although that's not always necessarily true. Even in the richest parts of the world, in the middle of the cities, people still struggled with access. Now, you will, however, notice that mobile coverage is much, much greater. 101% of the world's population have a mobile phone of some kind. Um, it basically means there are more mobile phones than people. So really, um, this has very important implications for when we think of the best way to engage students, um, because our biggest, the most common contact now with technology and technological learning is through a personal mobile device. Um, that's something that we really need to think about when we are designing systems for teaching and learning. Now, um, in the immediate response to the pandemic, education systems reacted by moving in two different directions. Uh, in, the, in the places where we had the infrastructure, it moved to online learning with varying degrees of success. But for most of the education institutions globally, they move back to broadcast education using TV and radio, simply because TV and ra radio reach far more people than online. Um, however, broadcast-based education consists of lecturers talking to the students. It's not two-way. Um, it's very teacher-centered and it tends to be inflexible, um, but it has the advantage that almost everybody can benefit. And also, and this is very interesting, it facilitates communal learning in small groups, especially with radio. If you have a small group of learners, if you want to have a small group of learners learning remotely, then if they're listening to a, a radio or a podcast, then it's easier for them to do it in a group rather than having to fight over who can access one screen at any one time. So that's an interesting tip for those of, of us who want to continue uh, education online. Audio actually works better for facilitating group uh, learning than screen-based um, screen based education. Um, however, you know, we're also aware that there was a, a big downside to the shift to online learning. Um, it would accelerate the mood, move towards more student-centered learning, but there are challenges, and the most biggest challenge is that the social element has been taken out. And from a teacher's point of view, this is also compounded by an increase in workload, We've seen fatigue, we've seen burnout. Lecturers and teachers all over the world have done a fantastic job in challenging circumstances and they're real heroes, but it's come with a cost. And so any, any system that we use in the future, any when we are presenting online learning, then we have to build in into every, um, in, into every offering, we have to build in a strong community focus. It's not just about delivering content and lessons. It's also making sure that people continue to feel part of a community. And this is because education is essentially a social activity. We tend to think of education at all levels, including tertiary, as transferring knowledge and transferring skills. But what is as important, if not more important, is education as a socialization process. By learning in groups with other students, with lecturers, we understand the basic principles of citizenship, emotional intelligence, cooperation, ethics, health, well-being. We, and at a basic level, we learn better when we are in a group with other people than when we are by ourselves. When we're by ourselves trying to learn alone online, motivation can become a serious struggle. Um, and now another very interesting thing that we've discovered, and this is again a practical, a very practically important tip for teachers and lecturers. It's this idea of familiarity and authenticity. And this is very important if you're a teacher. Essentially, if 
teaching is delivered online, it's far better if it's delivered online by somebody the students know personally in an environment that they are familiar with and that they can see, you know, they can see your face. Um, oh, by the way, this is uh, one of our active panels installed at uh, Giannizzi National University. But what I wanted to show here is that streaming a lesson delivered by somebody the students know from a familiar space like a classroom or a lecture theatre, even if there's nobody in there except the teacher, is far more effective and far more engaging than the most sophisticated and, and spectacular online interactive education platform. Uh, and this is particularly the case where we're talking about seminar or tutorials. Um, and it's also great news for teachers. Sorry, I'm going to, my blind is, I realise I keep glowing from the sun because, because I'm next to the window. I hope that's better. Um, it's great news for teachers because it means that the simplest tools that you already have to hand are more effective than having to learn a new fantastic system that has got to be learned and also populated with content. So I, I mentioned the importance of communities to compensate for the lack of socialization. Um, online learning management systems, doing online learning, it shouldn't just be about uh, content and skills and knowledge. It must incorporate this notion of communities, but what kind of communities? Well, from an education professional's point of view, it seems that the best type of community that we've seen um, during the last few years and also before, are organic net communities, organic networks that are built from the bottom up rather than imposed on top. I've already said that complex online platforms with strict hierarchies can actually be counterproductive because they demanding of time, they, you need, need to learn them, but also you feel constrained by the system. That's why Perhaps the most effective way of developing organic communities amongst the lecturing community and students as well is through texting. Simple texting among peers can provide a quick and easy route to building up an organic community without the need to learn yet another platform or spend time engaging with it. Texting to colleagues in a group or students or students texting amongst, amongst themselves takes a few minutes but it can be very rewarding. And I want to share with you an interesting model um, that can make this a very useful part of the teacher's day. Um, one of the, if you can build a organic community that's based on the principle of what the Japanese call the morning meeting, then it becomes very useful. Um, this is a technique that's used by Japanese companies and everybody gets together first thing in the morning and every for a brief meeting, everybody says what everybody says what they're doing that day, and that's first of all very important. It's so you don't feel isolated, and you know what all of your colleagues are doing for that day. Day, um, uh, people may express concerns, they may ask questions, they may also sing the company song, but you don't have to do that. That's not compulsory. But it's an excellent way for people to share experiences and get an understanding of what colleagues are currently working on. And I know particularly in tertiary education for lecturers, if you're working on your own particular research, it can, you know, you're the only person doing that. Um, it, it can, you can feel like you're working by yourself. So this is a very good way of opening up a mutual support group. So I came up with a concept, I call it the WhatsApp Chore. Chore is the Japanese word for morning meeting. Um, but it can use, you can use any simple uh, messaging uh, app that allows for, group, for you to set up groups. And all you do is every morning just takes a few moments to take part. You don't have to do it at the same time, but it's usually best if you do it before the day starts. What are you doing that day? Um, you know, any questions, any positive news, please share positive news. Don't use it as a platform just to complain. But, but you know, any issues, sure, talk about them. And also any advice for colleagues. Um, it should not, be judged, should not be judged. You shouldn't really have moderators unless the moderator is just working in a very kind of systematic way and not, not, and not moderating based on opinions. Um, this is very, very powerful, very powerful. And also it's even more powerful if it can be used as a method of sharing feelings. Now, again, the good thing about a messaging service is that it allows people to express their feelings through emojis. 
which people often find easier to do. It's easier to express how I'm feeling for an emoji rather than actually typing out a sentence. And we've seen that well-being, mental health and well-being and the need for interpersonal support has become one of the most important factors during the last couple of years. Okay, so um, again, that's kind of some an overview of what's this, the implications of what's happened from more from the teach tutors view, uh, point of view. Let's look at the students themselves. I want to focus on the students themselves because this new world that we find ourselves in has actually kind of accelerated trends that have been developing over several decades. And I'm talking about the relationship between the individual and technology and how it's evolved. I use the term cyber students because it refers to a concept of a learner as somebody who experiences but also manages their relationship to ed tech. Now, I'm gonna, I apologize, the next couple of slides are gonna be a little bit philosophical, but I then hopefully I can then show you the practical implications of, of what, I, what I'm talking about. Um, I want to introduce you to this concept of the exoself. Now, the writer Greg Egan coined the term exoself in his book, Permutation City, and he described it as systems linked to the self in a cooperative way, extending the mind and the body. What this means is that every one of us is surrounded by a cloud of applications, accounts, devices, we might have smartwatches, etc. And these expand our abilities and also allow us to inter interconnect with others. Now, the thing about the exoself is that each one is totally, utterly and completely unique. For example, if you, I don't think you see that, but if you, if you look at your smartphone interface homepage, you'll have a group of apps there. That arrangement and that choice is unique to you. Nobody on the planet is likely to have the same collection in the same way. So it's utterly unique and highly personal. And so this idea of the exoself, as that we have this little cloud of personal apps and interfaces that is unique to us, this is, then becomes a very useful way of thinking about how we can help students use EdTech to learn. Um, the other concept I want to bring you, talk to you about, and then again, this is, this is uh, to do with how we create our exoself, is the notion of bricolage. Um, this is a term that was invented by the French structural anthropologist Claude Lévi-Strauss. And basically it means we assemble meaning, we assemble our exocells by taking bits that interest us from all over the place, from everywhere, and then putting them together like a jigsaw. We don't like big systems. We don't like a single big system that allows us to do everything in one place. We like to take little bits of useful functionality and build our own personal app list. Uh, it's like a education playlist. Um, so the personal playlist we have of apps on our phones is like a playlist of music. It's a collection of things that interest us, that we find useful, that we ourselves have collected from useful sources. So this idea, this idea that students have this little collection of useful things they have created and they manage, that becomes very useful uh, when we're thinking about how best to approach them from an education point of view. The other thing I also need to stress is that you cannot control how young people interact with technology. You can try, you can really try, but you cannot control it. I'll give you an example. Um, some of you might remember MySpace from hundreds of years ago. Um, it was a social community that students used, um, that young people used, and one day the uh, teachers decided they'd go on MySpace too and use it as a platform for teaching. And what happened was all the students said, oh no, all the teachers are on MySpace. And they left and they went to the next one, which was Bebo. Um, same thing happened, the teachers went on Bebo. They try and use it as a platform for engaging with the students. The students went, oh no, all our teachers are on Bebo. And they all went to Facebook. Guess what happened next? Teachers went on Facebook. Everybody went on Facebook. Grandma went on Facebook. As soon as that happened, Facebook wasn't cool anymore and the students went off to Pinterest or TikTok or Instagram or wherever they are now. But what this means is you cannot control students' interaction of, with technology. So what can we do? 
Well, if we use the XSL as a model of engagement, then the paradigm completely changes. The increased need for remote and distance learning is pushed towards student-centered learning, um, but we mustn't treat learners as objects in systems, in big online management systems. We need to think of them as independent people with their own personal exocells that they need to manage and curate. So our priority as teachers is to make sure we teach our students the skills of how to become self-aware and self-directed learners. We need to teach them critical thinking, but we need to teach them how this system works and then we need to give them control. So show them where the apps are, teach them self-awareness, teach them metacognition, and then let them build up their own personal, personal spaces. Um, and to finish off, um, this brings me on to the role of future technologies such as artificial intelligence. Um, we have tended to ascribe too much power to artificial intelligence, and some places tried to use it, to help support online learning during COVID, it didn't actually work particularly well. Um, there is a version, however, that is quite interesting, and this is called the Diamond Age Primer. And again, this is from another book by another writer by Neil Stevenson. But the idea of a di Diamond Age pri Primer is essentially a personal device that contains within it an artificial intelligence that will act as a coach and a mentor in response to the individual and personalized lead, le, learning needs of the student. So think of it like a glorified Amazon suggestion engine. This is where, in the context of what I've been talking about, I think artificial intelligence will be more useful rather than using it as part of a big data collection system to try and control how the education system works and unfolds. So, in conclusion, so when we're incorporating students into hybrid systems or online systems in the wake of the pandemic, these are the key points I think that we need to think about. This idea that students should be self-aware um, and in control of their own exoself, the exoself model, it gives us an approach to think about students as individuals working in their own highly personalized space with their own apps and their own identities, and it's done through mobile. It's done through mobile devices. Remember when I said that there are more mobile devices than, than people in the world? Um, it is, is a better medium than doing it through um, the internet or broadband. Secondly, familiarity and authenticity. This is the most compelling and the simplest approach to teaching. Do your own bricolage, use what you've got. You know, a little bit of video, maybe do it by, vo um, by um, audio blogging. Use what you've got and present as a lecturer to your students. A familiar face or a familiar voice in a context that they already know is a thousand times more powerful than the most fantastic and complicated animated 3D online world. Bottom-up organic communities developed by texting is they work better and provide a lot more value for the individual and a lot more support than top-down systems. We have to provide our students with self-aware and self-reflective analytical skills so that they understand this situation and how to use it to their best advantage. And we have to give control. We have to cede control to the learners, give them the tools, give them the support and let them build their own learning worlds. Um, and so in conclusion, I think probably when we're talking about students in particular, the most important term is metacognition, uh, which I'm, by which I mean the, the awareness and understanding by students and lecturers, not only of their subject specialisms, but also the processes and structures of how they learn and teach so they can effectively manage them to everybody's best advantage. And I think, as I said at the beginning, that the last two years and the pandemic has helped accelerate a movement towards this new, new world. Um, so just to finish, um, again, these are the terms that I've used, exoself, bricolage, diamond age primers, here are some simple definitions. Um, I hope I haven't spoken for too long um, and I hope you found this interesting. 
um, and I'm in certainly interested in listening to your questions. So uh, thank you very much indeed, and I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thanks a lot, John, for this great and interesting presentation. There are lots of comments on the chat that it was fascinating and some very good ideas. Many people asked whether there's going to be a record available of this webinar. Yes, of course, the record will be published on the website of the British Council and on the YouTube channel of the British Council. You'll also get uh, a link to uh, this record, not to lose it. Well, let us look at the questions uh, that are there for John. Uh, there are quickly appearing comments, lots of words of thanks. Uh, John, there are questions to you. Do you believe that online learning has better results and opportunities? Do you believe that it is so? I personally think that learning takes place best in a classroom or a seminar room or a lecture hall with real people being able to learn and teach together. I think online learning will never ever be the substitute for that social experience. Um, I think online learning can be useful. I think it can support, it's, a, it's another tool to support what happens in the classroom, but I, that's the role I see it have. I see it as having a secondary role to the actual physical experience of teaching and learning. Thanks. There is also a question. Do you believe that a mobile phone is the main tool for teaching students for, for their learning? Um, I don't think it's the main tool. I don't think... I, I, education technology is a tool. It's not, it's not the main uh, medium through which learning and teaching takes place. That takes place, really, to, in my opinion, when in that personal interpersonal communication. Um, but as all in terms of all the ed tech tools, I think that for remote learning, um, this mo the mobile phone um, is the is a more powerful way. And it's also because, as I said, with my connectivity statistics, you know, every everybody's got a mobile phone, um, and it's a personal device that they can use themselves, and it's unique to them, uh, rather than fighting over computers at home. So I, of the education technology tools for online learning, I think mobile, yes. I think my, my opinion is probably the most important medium for doing it. Thank you. Uh, lots more questions there. Unfortunately, we won't be able to uh, read all of them, but we'll try a couple more. How? I was, sorry, I was just about to say, if anybody wants to contact me after this, um, please, Send me an email. I'm happy to come to, if anybody's got a questions, then I'll, I'll have, uh, answer them on email. Sorry. Sorry, Yuli, go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, again, our speakers, uh, they do leave their emails on the screen of their presentations, so you can contact them uh, with the questions that you have. So another question. How in digital world can we preserve or form the need for reading as a type of activity? That is a <laughs> that that's a whole webinar in itself. That's that's very very interesting. Um, there is a big debate at the moment I know about whether reading on a screen, um, the kind of the neuroscience of reading on a screen versus reading in a book. Um, I, I, again, I personally think that a technology can be used um, to support reading, but it's a different process. I mean, I think you need, if you're going to read on a screen, then you need something that is close physically to a book, as you can guess. So, for example, a Kindle, um, because a Kindle tries to, it gives you a reading experience similar to reading on paper. Once you start reading on a screen, then a different process happens, which is not as not as good for deep understanding and deep learning. Um, so if we are going to read on, scre on screens, screens have to be as close to a physical book as we can make them, I think.
Дякую. Джона, чи Thanks, John. Are you able to leave your email on the chat, please? Oh, yes, of course. Yes, I'll type it on the chat. Okay, and uh, let's do the last question for now. In your opinion, what kinds of methods and methodologies are the best for online learning and the most efficient? Um, like I said before, it's this idea of, of familiarity and authenticity. So, you know, if you can, as a teacher, they really, first of all, the simplest technologies. So texting, for example, because that everybody everybody has access to that. It's something quick and easy to do. Beyond that, I think that, um, as I said, just using the tools that you have at hand. So, for example, using your computer to record a video of yourself in your in the classroom, talking, explaining things, keep them short. Um, you know, the human attention span is very short, five to seven minutes. Um, and I th so I think, you know, the, those ways using tools that you've already got to hand and content you've already prepared. So, for example, if you're using our active panel, you will already have your own resources that you've created or that you've used on the active panel. We've seen some very successful situations where teachers have literally got their phone, stuck it on a tripod in front of the panel and then just talked as if they were giving a presentation. But the students have been watching it You've been watching it on live on on Zoom or Teams or or some similar similar media. Um, you know, you, you don't need to invest in and buy a big, I think, a big complicated new, you know, system. You can work with what you've got. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but that, that's my, you know, that's the message that I would give. Uh, thanks, John. Well, that was John Colick. Uh, he's surely going to share his email uh, in the comments so that you could email him if you uh, would like to and ask your questions. And we're moving on now. We're moving to our following speaker. And I'm happy to present Ksenia Tuchminova, who is head of Department of International Projects at the National Technical uh, University Dniprovska Polytechnica. Besides, Ksenia is a participant of the first year of teaching excellence program from the British Council and also a facilitator of the second year of the program. So, Ksenia, uh, I'm happy to give you the floor. Could you please turn on your mic so that we could hear you? Uh, thank you, Yulia. Can everybody see my presentation? Yes, we can. So, uh, thank you for the presentation, for my introduction. I'm happy to see all the participants. Uh, great to be involved into this program and be present at this event and to share some developments during these two years of the program and also together with you to uh, find out, uh, we're trying to find the answer to the question whether uh, contemporary teaching uh, technologies are uh, something saving or something testing the teacher. Uh, I would also like to remind you that for almost two years, we have been functioning in these conditions, which started uh, from the 12th of March, when the whole education system switched to online or distance learning. Uh, I'll remind you how it all started. Everybody, maybe this picture looks well. It looks very contemporary and uh, very fascinating. Um, uh, that's from the Council of Europe website with the recommendations on distance learning, but what happened in practice? We all started to, to search the ways how to uh, interact with our students. It would be great if you already had a Moodle course developed, or for example, university used to work on some platform and you already had some tasks prepared in this. And actually we are going to study what Zoom is. Uh, actually, I didn't even know what it was, how it all works. We started uh, learning how Microsoft Teams works and what kind of interesting tools are there for those um, and tasks and uh, sharing the screen, how Google Meet works, how all that works. And if this one thing freezes, the second one doesn't work or third uh, requires too much time, we also remember Skype and other programs. 
свої знання у вигляді презентацій, або в PowerPoint, або в презі. І ми почали вивчати ті е, додаткові інструменти, які додають нашим завданням, заняттям інтерактиву, щоб залучити студентів до активної взаємодії. Вивчали, що таке Kahoot, Padlet, як працюють різні е, додаткові інструменти Google, такі як Jamboard, або дошка Miro, або, можливо, якісь цікаві у MindMaster, або WorldWall, або HTML5, різні. Software and programs which added some interactive aspect to our work and it was necessary to assess the, uh, the students and we started to learn how Google platforms are working and Kahoot again or MindMaster and again Mentimeter or the uh, uh, once garden uh, feedback form and we also was maintaining communication with the students so with the help of the email and gmail or in office and we were using the joint chats in telegram in facebook messengers or in viber and this picture looks great now and it was changing to what you can see now on the screen and this is where the uh professor was not only using the platform and the lecture which was prepared beforehand but the uh, lecture was using a lot of chats messengers applications and it was necessary to understand how they work and learn to use them and to consolidate it with uh, one's course and the question is whether this is a technology for teaching or we lost ourselves in this variety of various tools which exist uh, at present and they are numerous one of the materials which uh, we were getting from the trainers during this program there was an article of uh, M michael sankley the professor of pedagogics and he is explaining the problem uh, by choosing the tool by us because we like it and we don't adapt it to the goal of our teaching we put technologies first uh, before the pedagogy and uh, this is a trial for the teacher and this is true but how we can transform it into a uh, life saver and uh, well the students are the uh, representatives of the z generation they always are online they are cooperating and, and they're communicating with the social media Переключитися на канал англійської мови для перекладу. Вибачте, 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 вибачте. Я дуже Ксенія за декілька and I would like to attract your attention to the fact that there is a certain correlation because the proactive participation of the students in carrying out uh, the uh, lectures and interaction and emotional engagement we can see on this slide that, that uh, there is a direct connection between the active participation uh, of the students and engagement during certain forms of uh, uh, interaction and uh, performing certain tasks so i would like to familiarize you with uh, the algorithms of uh, assessment and the matrix uh, which was offered to us by our british trainers uh, and uh, they called uh, this uh, the technology of big rat and uh, this uh, evaluation uh, scale depends on the proactiveness of the student in terms of using certain technology and to what extent uh, the role of the teacher is uh, proactive while using this technology and they assess it on three scales the role of uh, the student that uh, well passive active interactive and role of the teacher using the technology strengthening it or transforming it and uh, well using uh, the youtube application we know it very well so it was taken an example and uh, this uh, uh, actual application was analyzed for this scale if you have uh, uh, 
collected the material, share it with the students. It's the minimum role uh, of uh, the teacher and the passing role of the student. But if the teacher has uh, prepared a quiz, a game, a polling, so this is already interactive uh, uh, education for the student. But if the teacher has analyzed and commented for the student uh, um, the lecture, uh, engage them in the debate or discussion, this is also a creative participation of the student. So each technology could be assessed in accordance with the scale. And uh, the next thing sh which should be mentioned when we are choosing the technology, what is the criteria of assessment? At the side, you can see a number of those, but not all of them are most relevant for us. The most important maybe are the first three, the cost, the safety of data and security of data and accessibility. Also the support in different languages and an opportunity to adapt this tool and this application to the teaching needs or learning needs. This is another important criteria. And at the next slide, I'd like to introduce to you the material, which again, uh, was provided to us by our trainers and they suggested that we divide the tools in accordance with the following categories, the tools of assessment, you can see various formats of uh, uh, voting and uh, these are Menti, Kahoot, Asa Garden and others, other uh, software and the tools uh, for spreading the knowledge. Moodle and YouTube, Coursera are used very widely as well as other uh, uh, software and uh, the tools uh, to support communication, the Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Instagram, Facebook and all the rest you can see on the screen and also the tools for uh, actually doing the the individual tasks and these are the tools of student-centered education and here you can see the whole list of various tools frankly speaking if we take a look at this slide for the first time there are a lot of tools we are not using and maybe we don't know them too well and the the slide which could be useful to look something to look for something interesting for yourself and maybe choose another in tool. But there is a source uh, uh, for those who are interested in the online teaching tools. Uh, this is the list of tools. There were 200 of those. But as a result of the analysis of 2021, uh, there are 300 of them. These are top tools for learning. And the first top 20 is uh, the ones which make a lot of contribution into the teaching. And you can see that uh, the tools which we are using in our everyday teaching are most frequently used. YouTube holds the first place and PowerPoint and Zoom and a lot of those which we uh, use and which we know well. At the next slide, I would like to to show you the results of the polling. Out of 20, I have selected those which are less spread. Not Google Chrome, not Google Search, not Mail, but the rest of those 20. And we have only 10 of them. And I would like to suggest that you choose what of these applications are being used by you most often during teaching. So please, uh, let us... Uh, uh, screen the poll. So we have 10 tools. We have 20, but we have made a list of 10 tools for you to select. Well, I, well, I would like to remind you that the people who are listening to us through the Facebook cannot participate in this poll. This is accessible only to those who use Zoom for participation. We have another 30 seconds for polling. Please choose the most frequently used tools by you. Okay, thank you. I think there was this enough time to choose the most frequently used ones. And we can see the results now. Well, YouTube, Zoom holds the first place, Google Forms, and Google Meet. 
of the 15 percent uh, uh, use it, used and also google forms are used and i would like to thank you very much for participating in this poll and let's move forward before sharing another tool with you i would like to ask a question what is your attitude to this question or uh, the current modern technologies is it a means to be saved or is is a trial for the lecturer is it a rescue or a trial Thank you very much. Uh, let us look at the statistics. Well, it's a rescue. Thank you very much for this very optimistic approach. And, uh, and I would like to share another tool with you, which was developed in the presentation on uh, an implementation of our university jointly with the partners uh, to develop uh, the online lecture and uh, there is an instruction step-by-step uh, -step instruction how the online lecture could be developed starting from planning to implementation and the number of tools are being quoted here which i've mentioned today and uh, are using uh, the uh uh, the reference at the bottom of the screen, you can use uh, this manual and you can upload it and uh, please uh, you can use it. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you and thank you for an opportunity to share our experience and also share the experience which I've got while participating in the program Excellency in Teaching. Thank you. Thank you, Xenia. And uh, we would like to thank you for a very interesting presentation. Thank you for introducing various tools uh, which exist. And if you have questions uh, to our speaker, you can write them in the chat. Some people were writing that uh, there is an answer to, uh, both answers could be given to the last question, that these tools might be the uh the the rescue and uh, not only a rescue but they might only pose a lot of difficulties and become challenges for the ch teachers lectures and lots of various uh, comments in the chat a lot of uh, words of gratitude and whether we are going uh, to provide you with the presentations we are going to upload the presentations of the speakers so you will be able to go back to them and look again at those materials, look at the tools, test the tools which were demonstrated today. Sinian, there is a question to you. Whether, which tool you personally believe the most efficient and effective in your practical work? Oh, thank you very much for the question. I've seen, and it was interesting for me also to find out, well, uh, your, about your opinion, but everything depends. Uh, everything depends uh, on uh, the goal. But uh, Kahoot works very well. Menti works very well for the polls, which you have to make and to focus attention on a certain question and to collect the opinion of the students. And that works quite well. All this polling works very well with these tools. If you need the students to work uh, jointly then uh, maybe it's nice to use Jamboard, the online boards, when, where everyone can join in and quite quickly uh, 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 understand what needs to be done there and to do his or her part of the work on the task. I think that consolidating the visual aids and simplicity in usage is the most useful features of the tools which could be used during the lectures. But if it is necessary to explain for a long time how the tool works, so it doesn't work well, as for me, as my opinion is concerned. So the apps which could be created on the basis of the Google platform. Sorry, the sound is lost. 
Я перепрошую, тоді я маю вивчити камеру. Так, в кінці трошечки перервався зв'язок. Скажіть, yeah, ласка. Yeah, what's the problem with the sound? Ксенія, are you using YouTube while teaching? Personally, you. Я, чесно, ні, не використовую. Well, uh, frankly speaking, I don't. So, sorry. Well, YouTube is a leader. Uh, apologies, the sound, the sound is not working. Unfortunately, we cannot uh, hear Xenia. Well, we are losing the connectivity. Uh, we are going to move forward. There was an interesting comment. Uh, and by the way, Xenia, as for the uh, your question, whether th this is a trial or uh, the... Uh, the rescue. It's a trial for the sake of rescue. That is an interesting uh, answer. The participants decided to formulate the answer this way. But now we are going to give the floor to our next speaker, Anastasia Yakovenka, and she is the senior teacher of the Chair of Mathematics and Physics of the Melitopol Pedagogical University, named after Bogdan Kmelnitsky. And she's going to share with us uh, her uh, approach to teaching math as an art. And Anastasia is the participant and facilitator of the Program of Excellency in Teaching in the British Council. And today she's going to share her own experience of teaching her students, mathematics in particular. Today's webinar will be interesting to all the uh, representatives of various educational areas. We told you about that. Uh, well, I would like to welcome everyone. Mathematics is a very abstract, multifaceted and complex science. And to understand how it is necessary to teach the disciplines of the mathematical area, we have to understand what our youths are associ associating with the process of learning maths. And for this purpose, I have created at the Mentimeter a small polling, which actually creates a cloud of answers and words. And I offered my students and my acquaintances of, uh, from the youth media to answer the question, what do you associate the process of learning maths with? And the majority wrote that these are numbers, formulas, logic, but uh, the answer is that it's a pain stress, uh, and this is very complex. And the maths is a complex science, that's true, and it's associated uh, with a lot of difficulties. Let us, let us play a game. And, well, somehow these two things like playing and maths do not uh, really uh, align very well, but it is possible to use the games and mathematics gives an opportunity to our brain to have a little rest and then to work intensively. You have an opportunity now uh, to stamp with the help of the annotate tool. You can see this tool. It's a pencil and a stamp. So choose a couple of pictures which you believe are uh, belonging to teaching of maths most and actually mark those pictures you can you can mark several pictures and we will see which picture is going to get most of the marks uh, which is going to be the winner in this game while we are no, we are looking at the uh, graphs and formulas and people are writing that all the pictures relate to maths, even the, even the flowers, and that's great. And formulas and a ruler, and yes, that's true. Mm -hmm. And also people mark uh, the, the character uh, looking like mandala. Yes, there is a hidden formula. Something is hidden there. That's great. That's interesting. So, 
And people give answers to the chat. Uh, yeah, people cannot use the telephone to mark them. Formulas, graphs, uh, rulers. I would like to create some suspense and give you an answer at the end of my presentation. It is true. Maths, mathematics is somewhat interesting. I will try now. And, and complex. But we can present it so that to make it so that the lesson would inspire for the future work. And this is my goal number one when I am teaching analytical geometry for the first year students uh, who came from school to our university and they don't understand uh, how things work in the university. And I'm always uh, willing to show them that Mathematica is a varied science. And in our University of Melitopol, which are training future teachers, uh, I am trying to uh, actually share my experience with them. And now I would like to offer you now my experience of teaching. And the topic is the polar system of coordinates. And this is a challenge. So how to teach it so that it will dynamic, interesting, varied, accessible, and in a distance learning mode? How can we do that? On my way uh, for searching the answers, I actually create three markers where the lessons are to be taught uh, in which format and what could be given to the students so that they don't fall asleep in front of the screen. There are not which methods, which means uh, tools are to be chosen. And for me, my, my assistants in teaching are the tools which are accessible to me for online, uh, direct online. This will be Moodle platform which our university has organized. We have a special site for distance learning and there is a tool of Big Beta and we can use Zoom as well. Any tool will be uh, acceptable. And I will tell you in more de de detail of, of, about Big the Better. And it's asynchronous education because not all of the students have an opportunity to learn online and asynchronous uh, uh, education uh, uh, is being organized on Moodle platform, which is a difficult part of it, but some quick things could be done. So Telegram, we have a cha Telegram channel and this is where we communicate. So I wanted to tell you the following about the Moodle. There was a question about YouTube. There are a lot of interesting materials that uh, could be found in YouTube on all the disciplines and on the Moodle platform. I I have the screenshot of this discipline and there is a reference to YouTube uh, uh, videos uh, uh, related to this discipline and there is a reference to the projects which were developed by the students within the framework of this discipline, which help then to understand the essence of uh, this topic. I also wanted to uh, mention the following about Big Blue Button. This is a short a screenshot from uh, my lesson today. There is an opportunity also to carry out testing. Uh, there is no need to look for the in external resources and I can do it the way is convenient for me. There is an opportunity to share the screen and uh, launch the presentation. And this is where you can see the uh, problem which is being uh, solved on the online board. And online board is a, you know, substitute of the work in the classroom where we can work together. And we have even the rating of my favorite boards, uh, starting from bit paper to jam board. And uh, there is a graphical um, uh, well, actually, I am using uh, the, uh, the, the, but I have uh, polled my students uh, and they can use these platforms uh, for writing them. So 
uh, online boards, big paper. Uh, this is how to work together at the same sheet of paper and everything is being done synchronous. And Jamboard is, uh, is useful for the group work because at different pages, different groups of people can work. And Mira is a large toolkit, but for maths, uh, there is no way to use the to up, upload the formulas uh, and the, this option exists at bit paper and i think these are too many tools i believe that the simpler tools we are using the better and also to uh, to substitute this conservative way of working at the blackboard we have to forget everything old and start work simultaneously what is simultaneous work you know well like uh, for example uh, in the olden times in school several people were working at the same board and this is the photograph of the offline work of the students uh, uh, with the blackboard and physically and uh, the synchronous work could be also arranged online and it looks like this uh, this was a group work for the first time the students were uh, uh, putting the dots and they use their own colors and I could assess how the student is working and how quickly they are responding whether they are accurate or not I could correct their mistakes and tell them what's wrong and they were able to resolve the problems and they know that each student is working with his or her own color we discussed that up front and what is the feedback uh, well about this work the students are the majority is comfortable to work offline and because there is uh, an opportunity to communicate to caucus uh, to discuss uh, and uh, the teacher emotionally feels when the students need such support online we don't have it uh, and i'm asking but why are you communicating online and they say that it's not comfortable uh uh, uh to talk online though so some students uh, are quite comfortable to talk online but they are the minority as of the online work sometimes the internet is not working so it's very important to uh, give them an opportunity to work asynchronously when there is a recording of the lesson and when the materials are provided for them with which they can work but uh, it is necessary to resolve so many problems so what should we do about it well just giving the uh, numerical uh, assessment is, is just a banality so we decided to use other other ways here we were using the hearts and it becomes live on my page and this was uh, prior to the saint valentine's day and we were using the polar system of coordinates it's great and they can do it themselves but with the help of what i'm using for my work the visualization of uh, such mathematical elements uh, in the uh, GEBRA environment. It's a dynamic mathematical environment which gives an opportunity to create living uh, drawings which are moving dynamically and they are interlinked. In 2005, so many years ago, I, this software was developed in Kharkov, Techi, and it uh, was not uh, actually disseminated, but GeoGebra was at the same level, uh, because, and it was developing because it's in free access, and everybody who wanted to could join in and to improve this environment. What is interesting and important about it, uh, the dynamic geometry uh, ge GeoGebra are related very strong functionality lots of functions and it is even i cannot master all those functions there are lots of them it is actually possible to create an extended reality uh, to uh, to build the paths and the web pages are accessible in many languages and it is built as a large social media and where people from all over the world can share their projects and it is possible to find anything and free access 
and uh, the mobile phones were mentioned and uh, this uh, software is uh, uh, could be used through mobile phone browser computer and uh, tablet can be used and if you have accounts all of them are related and uh, oh what so while you are waiting for your child from the mobile phone you can work on your computer and edit it it's very very convenient very very interesting and it gives opportunity to the students to see the results outcomes of their work and to enjoy it because my students are drawing 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 but when they can see an outcome uh, if they don't see the outcome, they lose interest. So the task was to draw the curves and they were doing that. They were correcting themselves and then they created very, very difficult, very complex things. But when they see the outcome, the result, I hope it will be launched. And, uh, they can understand what they've done and uh, this is what the students were doing and uh, this is these are their comments so they said that they could check their homework quicker but it was impossible to cheat because it's all visualized and uh, this is an additional help in visualizing the process in which they are engaged and also i have another kind of work this is a creative work and i gave students two days uh, to develop the curve which they've chosen to find the information to present it and they had to reflect the properties of using this curve. Also, they were writing the papers, presentations, but it was an award for me that one of the students has created a video where she compared how it is possible to build the cardioid, which is the curve in the polar system of coordinates. So with the uh, some, uh, you know, additional tools and how it is possible to do it with a, a package of GeoGet. And she was so happy to tell about it. So actually they're doing even more than for example, there is a task. This uh, task, uh, this material is available on my YouTube channel. There's going to be a court in the, in the end, so you'll be able to look at that video. It's very interesting. And I was just uh, uh, fascinated. And actually, I wanted to reward the students. About the creative works, it wasn't even about the evaluation, you know? We simply were making those creative works to share with our group mates because that's interesting material. So here it was learning not for the sake of getting a grade. It is about getting knowledge. And for me, that's very valuable. And uh, to quickly find something, to quickly say something, you don't need to sit around and create some. There is a base of resources here. You can actually find it, the resources. And I really wanted to show what a spherical coordinate system is. It sounds uh, very complicated, but actually it's very interesting. And uh, actually found that instrument like GeoGebra, Geo which actually shows well the spherical system of coordinates and we showed it in augmented reality. That is this spherical coordinate system to the screen of a mobile phone was in our audience and we looked around what kind of angles were kind of ready, where and how everything is. And this is this actually moved in dynamic way. And it was clear for the students so that they could see everything. It was all screen and uh, where it is all used. 
So, uh, so there is also the trajectory in, in the space. They were really captivated by it. They were captivated and uh, and they kept asking that for current students who are rather passive, you know, uh, I mean, this these questions, they actually were rather interesting. I wanted uh, the students to talk about these methods, methods which we use. And also what for me was important they wrote that after school, they understood that maths could be really interesting even online. And I wanted to add about this math education sections from all over the world and Facebook. There is a page of GeoGebra and uh, uh, there are actually lots of interesting things that can be used for your work. And as for these pictures, uh, this is the Archimedes uh, spiral that is actually used for space. The mandalas that you see there, that's cardioids, which draw uh, out the trajectory of Earth and Venus, and this beautiful uh, flowers that's also geometric shapes. And we're studying that with examples. And in my opinion, when work of a student and a teacher is in partnership, when the teacher is getting prepared and the student getting is getting prepared, and when the student has demand for that, then actually the teacher has the will to provide this knowledge. I really wanted to, th to thank uh, the Teacher Excellence Program for expanding our horizons. When you don't see the light in the end of the tunnel and you're thinking, why should I be teaching those nurse students? Then there is a cohort of people which says, you know, they want to improve ourselves. And there we have lots of teachers joining who wish to become better and uh, higher education in Ukraine is going to develop and self-improve as well, because uh, the mind of efficient people is not about progress, it's about opportunities. So I believe that online instruments and distance learning, they are our opportunities. So create and get inspired. There is a QR code for my YouTube channel here and my email. Thanks for your attention. Uh, thank you, Anastasia. That was a really inspiring presentation. It seems to me that some teachers who we have here, they are already, they would go to your course. They are writing that they should, that they could have already started doing that. And if somebody has any questions, you can actually ask them now on the chat. We still have several minutes for that. So you are able to ask those uh, questions to Anastasia. Okay, that was, yeah, that was really an inspiring speech. Lots of comments with thanks about your presentation. So, do you have any questions? And if there are no questions, then we're going to move on. Somebody is going to say that even though they are not a mathematician, but the journalists, they will still try using it in their lectures. That's good. Well, we are happy to hear that what our teachers are talking about. You can just take it and also use it on uh, during your lessons with your students. So that's why we're actually organizing this event. So, Anastasia, how much time do you spend for preparing one topic? Well, actually, as my teacher says, a good picture is not created uh, quickly. That's why it cannot really be created quickly. So, yeah, well, we are drawing pictures, we are taking pictures for our pleasure. For me, creating projects like that, 
that's my enjoyment and i share them in social networks because i like it uh, i like making good things and uh, so i tell the students like i created a good thing for you and they tell me okay and that's what we also uh, so that's how we share that and i also would like to say that what we made today is later used the following year. I mean, it doesn't go away. Those projects that the students make and they are then uploaded on YouTube or somewhere else and we use them. That's already the following generation doing that. So this all doesn't pass in, way, in vain. And actually there's, I have to say that to create a curve, you just need one and a half minutes to sit. But to think how to create it, you need a bit more time for that. Okay. So they really ask you to have a slide. You, can you show a slide with the contact data? Yes. Yeah. Yes, you can take a picture of that. And also we are going to preserve all those things and we'll send you this. You'll have all of that and uh, quite possibly, well, maybe that's with online training how much time do you actually spend for that for that task yes question please when during online learning how much time do you, uh, how much time does the lesson take yeah actually it's standard one hour 20 minutes regular university lecture but we managed to do a lot during that time well, thanks. I think that they were good presentations, really inspiring ones. I still have questions to all our speakers that in the end, uh, so they could comment and maybe say uh, some couple some comments about why you actually should be using those education technologies and maybe uh, how how you could get other colleagues involved who still don't know what to start from who are still a bit lost how we could help them for example so that they are also able to start using technologies first we'll ask john i guess Hi. Um, by the way, those last two presentations were really, really, um, really interesting. So thank you. Uh, thank you for my colleagues, to my colleagues. Um, I think I would go back to what I was saying uh, earlier, um, that the best way to support colleagues uh, in the use of technology is through cr by creating these organic, simple text-based um, communities. Um, I think that, that these can be used uh, very simply and easily, but also a way of kind of quickly and easily providing support, providing help, providing resources. Um, I think also there's a, there's a very famous saying that you should never ever forget the mind of the beginner. Um, and this is something that we think is very important to Promethean. It's that um, when you are introducing technology into a, an institution like a school or a university, there is a tendency to focus on the people who are confident and enthusiastic, the, the people who are already experts. You shouldn't do that. You should focus on the people who are the real beginners um, and also the people for whom technology may be a little bit intimidating. Um, I think all the effort should go on those people, the people who are the experts and the enthusiasts, they will look after themselves. Focus on your absolute beginners for your training, for your support, and this idea of organic communities, I think, is a great way for people to share ideas and support with their colleagues. So that's that's my my opinion. Thanks, John. Ksenia, your opinion about the same topic. Yes, thanks. It seems to me that the best factor for involving, it's involving as many teachers as possible who are interested and who use the new technologies, that would be the events which allow to share your experience and uh, to motivate each other. Uh, we have a great example, like teaching excellence program from the British Council and webinars like that, where we can 
show each other those practical cases and practical experience using technologies in the uh, everyday practice. Thanks, Ksenia. Anastasia, and from you. I totally agree with Ksenia that such webinars motivate uh, and activate, let's say, teachers. And uh, also, I believe that social networks, uh, they still play their role. And uh, if we have a page of GeoGebra where where people who are interested or researchers uh, show their developments, their fascinating bits and pieces, that motivates people who read that. And even though in our social networks, uh, I hope that we don't just have beach photos and vacation pics, we can also share our developments uh, to activate your colleagues, so to say. Uh, thank you, colleagues. And personally, I'm always inspired when I look at Facebook pages from Anastasia, who actually uh, uploads her developments all the time. So I really recommend you to subscribe to her pages. Thanks to all participants of the webinar. I see that the topic is actually very interesting and useful. It's something that uh, the participants care about. So thank you for participation. I'll remind you yet again that if you have some questions, you'll be able to email uh, our speakers. And uh, we are also recording this webinar. The webinar is going to be also published on, on the YouTube channel of the British Council, also on the website. Plus, uh, everyone who actually is there on Zoom, we have your emails. So we will send you those links and also to the presentations of the speakers. If you are watching us on Facebook, I'm really asking you to send this to on these emails, uh, your email, and then uh, we're also going to send you all the materials. Apart from that, you're also going to get certificates uh, of participation in this event. It's going to be sent to you in the beginning of the following week. So please, don't uh, email me the very second the webinar finishes uh, to ask us about the certificates. You will get them for sure. Uh, this, uh, this is an electronic certificate that you'll be able to download, uh, put your name in and save it. There's going to be a confirmation for your participation in this webinar. Besides, I would like to remind you that this is the third webinar in the series of uh, Contemporary Approaches to Learning. We already had a webinar on creativity in teaching. We already had a webinar on uh, student evaluation. You can also view those on our YouTube channel of the British Council. All those recordings are stored there. Now we are going to make a short pause for the webinars to form a plan for our future events, uh, to also uh, look at your feedback and recommendations about further topics, so that later we could also provide you the most inspiring and fascinating presentations and webinars like we had until today. Uh, you will also get uh, a survey via email. We really ask you to fill it out because uh, your feedback is very important and it helps us to move on. It helps us to choose the topics that are going to be of the biggest interest for you. Thanks to our speakers. Thanks to all the participants. Thanks for being with us today. We wish all of you great health, peace, and see you later. All the best.